Hello and welcome to Devin's Workshop. Today I will be showing off the TR Cowbell, which is a 16-step sequencer that I've been working on for a couple months now. Uh, it is based upon a, an 8-step sequencer by Todd Kurt, also known as Toddbot. And here is Todd Kurt's GitHub and the open source project for the Pico Step Sequencer. And as you can see, there are eight step switches. Uh, really awesome, amazing project. I fell in love with it the second I saw it. Although the eight step sequencers are very popular for mobile. So they're really easy to compact, to take with you. Um, he actually has his on battery power, which kind of goes with the, you know, the smaller size compact form. Uh, but I wanted to make one that was 16 steps. And it was not as easy as just copying everything and trying to double it. Uh, there's a, there was a limit to the amount of uh, GPIO that the Pico has uh, in order to do 16 switches and 16 LEDs. So here's my GitHub. This is where all the project code lives. Uh, but the main one, the main repository that I do all my projects in for CircuitPython is just one click right there, right from the front page. And we'll go to boards because this is a Raspberry Pi Pico, Raspberry Pi Pico and TR Cowbell. And that's how you get to the page. And we are dealing with version 1.2. 1.2 has an issue that we need to resolve. So here's a closer look at the board. This is a Raspberry Pi Cow Pico W for wireless. So there's a Pico variant, which is non-wireless, and a Pico W, which is wireless, and this is the wireless version. Um, and because it's a Pico W, most people end up just calling this the Pi Cow, which is where the name Cowbell comes from. Because add-on boards for Pico are known as bells. So this is a Pico W Cowbell. And then, but there will be many, many other Cowbells in the future, I am sure. Um, so that's why it's specifically the TR cowbell. So there will be plenty of other um, cowbells. Like uh, Adafruit has already come out with a couple cowbells. So I guess you can call it a bell if it only uses the Pico or a cowbell if it uses the Pico W. But since both use the same exact footprint and the same exact pinouts, it really doesn't matter. So you can call it a bell or a cowbell, either one. Uh, but add-on boards are bells. So in order to get 16 step switches working, you need multiplexers, these two big guys. And this allows two pins from the Pico to control each multiplexer. And then each multiplexer has uh, 16 input output. So you got 16 input output, 16 input output, 32. And you're like, okay, but you've only got 16 switches. Well, each one has an LED. So if you add 16 LEDs and 16 switches, you get 32. So these two chips exactly <laughs> were the amount that I needed for 32. Um, so 32 is the, the big number. And Toddbot's uh, Pico step switch sequencer actually does use 16, but because of the LEDs, it's it's eight, eight and eight, which is 16 input outputs, which for the Pico was pushing pushing 16 for the Pico, as well as a rotary encoder. Uh, I added the buttons, and of course we have MIDI in and MIDI out, which I have yet to test. Like I, I don't even have any MIDI devices, so this is all of this is Toddbot's design uh, that I've yet to, to, uh, to test. Uh, and there's an octocoupler right here. Uh, and then we've got tiny little microcapacitors, resistors galore, um, address pads, which those need addressing. Literally, they're called ITC addressing, but those need to be addressed and fixed because these don't work correctly um, either. So that's the introduction of the TR Cowbell. And there's some cool PCB art. So we've got Will Farrell 
on the back doing the cowbell sketch with Christopher Walken. And that that's really how this whole entire thing got named cowbell. It's just it's really that simple. It's just it's they're all jokes. They're all references to jokes. Even my name being printed in papyrus font is a joke uh, based on a Saturday Night Live sketch. Um, yeah, so it's just this is all artsy fun. It's just fun. I had fun making that, too. Uh, so we have a serious issue, though, uh, which is what the main goal of this video is about for cowbell owners. Uh, currently, these are out in the wild. People do have their hands on them. I'm not going to say a lot, or I'm not going to say how many, but there are some. And I've been referring to them as beta testers, but they're just TR Cowbell owners. They own the boards. They can do whatever they want with them. There's no uh, prerequisite for beta testing. It's just I call them beta testers because I'm they give me feedback, and uh, it is uh, the feedback has been very much appreciated. Um, even things as, as small as like making sure I put a dot on the silk screen for the octocoupler. Just, I mean, just great suggestions. Everyone that's contributed like constructive criticism and suggestions has been just awesome. Uh, so the problem is that both of these MCP chips are taking up uh, both buses, which does not allow the Stemma port, Stemma QT port, or this breakout to work. So these are non-functional because this chip is using this bus so it's always going to say bus in use if you try and use that that's a uh, that's a mistake um, and I didn't find that one until uh, it's pretty too too late to the game there um, so tonight is going to be figuring out a fix and I'm going to do it live I've never I've not attempted this but I kind of know what I'm doing so I kind of think it should be fine and if the board catches on fire, then, you know, whatever. That's fine, too. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go to the computer. And I will detail the problem, and then we'll go over some potential solutions. So this is Easy EDA. This is a PCB design tool. It's a free one that I use, and it has great integration with uh, open source hardware, OSH, or Oshwa. Not the Oshawa for safety, but open source hardware. So if you go to my GitHub and you open up the schematic link, it'll bring you here. This is interactive. You can play with it and everything. Um, you can even save your own revisions of the boards um, if you know what you're doing and you can save the project. This is all totally open source. You are free to use this. So here I'm going to describe how an ITC bus works on the Pico uh, and that there's only two of them. So you've got bus zero and bus one. Bus zero is usually for PCB developers and they put like uh, embedded devices on bus zero. And bus one is usually an open lane for users to add whatever peripherals they want, like a display or a temp sensor, etc. cetera. Um, and you could, as a PCB designer, put those temp sensors, you know, or any ITC device. And it, they're a lot like train cars. So you have, in this case, the MCP23017 device is an I2C device. And then you can add another device behind it, a lot like train cars. And you can just keep chaining them on one bus as long as you want, forever and ever and ever. I don't even know what the total amount of I2C devices per bus is, but it's probably in the hundreds or thousands. As long as the power requirements are met, you can add tons. Of, bu of bus devices. So the problem is that I did that. I added the second MCP chip on the other bus. I took up both buses. So there's no free lanes available for users to plug anything in, which was an original design decision. If you're making embedded devices, you can either have them a sole purpose this only does this one thing, and there's no expansion, which is how I originally started the design. But then as things progressed, I wanted to allow people to have the option of adding their own 
stuff on any pin. That, that's important, is on any pin. You can still add anything on bus 0 or bus 1, but only on very specific pins. But if you don't use the second bus, you can add whatever you want on any pin. So if you really want to get an idea of like how bad I screwed up, um, here this is basically what I did. <laughs> like, I, I, I pretty much did that. <laughs> like, I took up both buses with only one chip, one device per bus, which locked both of the buses. So here's the Pico pinout, and the reason I wanted to impart upon you why there's bus zero and bus one is because when you get to the Pico pinout, you can see, you know, there's I2C0 and I2C1. And if you go down the list, I2C0, I2C1. And the same on the other side. So every pin is I2C0 or I2C1. So there's two buses, two physical buses. And the same with uh, SPI, SPI, uh, which is Serial Peripheral Interface. So the SPI bus has 0 and a 1. So the SPI bus has two buses, and the same for UART, which is slow and antiquated, but there's still two buses, two UARTs. So you get two UARTs, two ITCs, two SPIs. And if you use them, then it's hard-coded to whatever pin you use it on. So I'm using one multiplexer chip on GP10 and 11, and the second multiplexer chip on GP12 and 13. So how does that really apply to the, the train analogy? As soon as I plugged in the multi, as soon as I hard traced the multiplexer and gave it an address on bus one, this is what happens to every other pin on bus one. They disappear. You cannot use them. You can attempt to use them, but it will say that I2C1 is busy on pin 10 or 11. So you lose all those as soon as you use the pin. Okay, so that's what happened with one chip. So what happens if you put the second multiplexer in? This happens. Boom. They're all gone. You can only use I2C on pins 10 through 13 now. That's, that's how buses work. <laughs> I just want to detail like how, how much of a screw up it was. And it's funny, you could, you know, as long as you can laugh at yourself. Uh, live and learn. I won't make that mistake again. Not with I2C anyway. Uh, probably not with any bus. Uh, uh, the problem, I think, was I thought there were more buses. That there was like three buses or four buses. I didn't realize there were only two buses and I was taking up both of them. Part of the problem here is these two pins in particular, GP27 and 26. This is where the Stemma port is. And as you can see, it's on I2C1, bus 1 which is the same as pin 10 and 11. So if I can cut the physical trace on pin 10 and 11, take the multiplexer chip that's here and put it on bus zero with the other multiplexer, chaining them together on one bus, that should free up I2C1, which will do that and give me back I2C1 on multiple pins, especially these two, which are used for Stemma which is why I went to free up I2C1 instead of I2C0, specifically because of Stemma. Thankfully, I don't have anything else that uses I2C on any other pin except for Stemma and these uh, multiplexer chips. So now we're going to start cutting traces. So here's the board. 10 and 11 have to be cut. And then we jumper the SCL and SDA from one chip to the other. So once we cut 10 and 11, that's going to cut um, clock and data to the second chip. And then we're going to have to bodge fix a wire um, because we want to chain them. We can just bodge wire from here on the underside of the board from here to here, and from uh, that one, yeah, second, 
So pins uh, two and three over here. Two pins two and three over here. And then in order to fix the addressing, um, you can really once once both are on the same bus, you can pick which address you want. And now it's time to go over the address mistake. This is how it looks on the board, right? You've got your I2C addressing, two rows. The MCP really wants three, three rows, where you have a 3B3 as the third row. So you have your three volt pad signal and you either solder it to ground, like up here, if you solder all three to ground, you get 0x20. But if you solder one of them high to 3 volts, you'll get 0x21. So I figured that's how it's done. It's not like other I2C chips that only need ground for addressing. Okay, so we go back to the board and you're like, okay, so where do we get 3, three volts from? Luckily, there's a main 3-volt line right next to it. To a resistor so we just have to go from this pad take the solder off because all the boards that came out uh, they have they're soldered up already um, so take the solder off between the ground and the signal pad go from the signal pad to the 3 volt and that should give this one um, 0x21 address that's the plan that's how I'm going to attack it. So, as for actually cutting the trace, where's the best place to do that? We could cut right here. However, it's kind of hard to get to. It That's a really hard place to get into with a, uh, a utility knife. Something really sharp to just cut the traces, and scrape away some of the trace, you know, etc. So let's go find somewhere that's got a lot of space. Here's a place that where they're right next to each other. But if you're using a really sharp utility knife and you cut through this, you might cut through this one or you might cut through that one. So we really want to find a place where these two lines are isolated. Like right here. So you could cut right right towards this, this mounting hole, right above R9. And just slice right through those two. That would do it. Or you could come over here and do it here. Uh, here's a little busy. Here, you know, it kind of looks like a good place. These two are like right next to each other right there. So that would be a good place. Uh, yeah, so either one. Right there seems pretty safe. And if you're wondering about the, the bottom layer of the board, you know, all the traces on the bottom layer, well, that's below the FR4. That's on the complete opposite side of the board. So you don't have to worry about the bottom traces. You only have to worry about the top traces. Uh, as long as you don't go like too deep through the board, uh, which I, I, I don't see happening with a utility knife. So there's, there's really not much to worry about that. You could also use an X-Acto blade or, or some type of uh, pick tool, scrape away the trace, whatever your preference is. Um, either way, these two have to be cut, and I have personally never cut tra a trace before, so this is going to be a first for me. Worst case scenario, and I have to solder it back together, where would I want to have to get my hands into resolder? That's also a good question to ask. Like, if this fix does not go well, how do I back out of it? That's another good question. The traces I'm thinking about are like right there. Like those two or either that or right there uh, and with a utility knife I mean I could probably do it that way and be okay and these two are like yeah that that would that would not work very well because yeah so preferably I'd want somewhere where I could cut it this way just that place does not exist so this this angle I think I'm gonna go right here right there on that one right above the, the R9 mounting hole and that is for T3 
10 and 11. Because I'm about to cut this thing, I want to double check. I just want to double check again. I'm about to cut through traces. <laughs> yep, those are the ones I want. Eek. Eek. I have no idea if I'm doing this right. I have no idea how deep I'm supposed to go. And I can't see anything because the camera's like right in my face. You know what? I think I am going to get the microscope out. So I got this uh, cool little microscope. Christmas present from my brother. Thank you. Eek. Okay. I made it look worse than uh, I think it actually is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I really have no idea what I'm doing. I really don't. Okay, so I put on some clear nail polish. There's no metallic content in the nail polish that I can tell. Uh, seems to be working okay. So I'll just wait for that to harden. I could go all the way from 12 and 13, uh, solder a bodge wire here, and then run it all the way over to these two resistors because one resistor is for clock and one is for data. These are pull-up resistors. Uh, so I could wire straight to the resistor. That is another way of doing it. Um, also, you could just uh, go all the way from the bottom of the pin here, run a wire all the way straight to that one if you wanted as well. Uh, but I, I like the idea of chaining them together as a real I2C bus would, kind of like with Stemma plugins, so they're just directly chained on the same bus.
So we've got pin 2 to pin 2. That's not the actual names, but it's just second from this left side to second from this left side. Then on the bottom, it's third from the left to third from the left. So next, we have to remove this and wire that to the resistor. This is a big old solder blob. Oh wow, that's actually it's actually going up pretty quick. Oh, that works so cool. God, I love this thing. Look at that. Why would you look at that? Go to that one. I can just go to that one. I don't think that matters. Yeah, let's do that. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We'll see. That should be all that's needed. So we've got those and then that along with the cut trace. And that should give this one the address of 21. So switches 1 through 8 will be on OX21. And switches 9 through 16 will be on OX20. Okay. Circuit Pi. Uh, I think I'm running just Code Pi. Yeah, with the display. Well, what I had the display on a different bus. So now I'm going to have to move the buses around. Well, it looks like that worked. I just flipped around a couple things in, in Moo. Uh, namely, change the address to the correct address. Uh, change the bus from 1 to 0. Uh, removed the entire um, ITC1 bus. Just commented it out. And GP11 and 10 are now, they're running on pins 13 and 12, basically. Uh, so the bus is, both devices are running from GP12 and 13. So the entire bus, uh, the entire bus 0 is now 12, 13. And... On the correct address in the correct bus and as you can see it just works 
Yeah, these orange ones, these three are still the prototypes. This is the, the good orange one, so I'll just use that. Uh, the one in one is uh, the multiplexer chips. So this is uh, multiplexer zero and then the switch number. Yeah, it's pin five because it starts from zero. So it's actually the sixth button, but it's five because zero, it starts at zero. So we got five. Uh, this one. Oh, the, I desoldered the, the switch on the back. Um, yeah, this one has a, a cold joint. This is what happens when you have a cold solder joint. The switch, the switch doesn't want to work right. This has nothing to do with the 3D printed enclosure. It's, it's the solder joint on the back that I have to go and resolder and fix. Uh, but I already know that that's, that's the problem. Um, which brings up a troubleshooting issue. If, uh, if your LEDs aren't working, then look on the back for the, especially the ground pin uh, for the LED. And if the switch isn't working, which it is here. Yeah. But if the switch is not working, then check the ground pin on the back of the switch and make sure that that doesn't have a cold solder joint. And it goes all the way up to 1.7. 1.7 is the max. And this is how it should work. And therefore, Stemma should actually be able to work now. This one is HTU31D temp and humidity and a BMP390 temp and pressure. Yep. Oh, wait, it didn't crash. What? And it's got power. Little green LED on there. Green LED denotes power. So we're getting power to Stemma at least. Well, power is the easy part. Power would work anyway. Just to make this easier for now, I'm just going to start with one. We'll just start with one. And that is the HTU31D. It does have this, which I can just use. That might be a bad idea. I'll go with IT, I'll just stay with ITC1 because I know it's ITC1. That was the whole point is to get ITC1 back. So I'm not going to rename that. Uh, and this should be on pins 27 and 26. Yeah, I really don't want to print my serial number though. And why would I, why? why? I even want to do that. HTU heater on, HTU heater off. Oh, it, does it need a true or false on the heater? It's going to have a default. Um, oh, I2C. This should be I2C1. Getting no errors. Oh, there we go. Unexpected indent on line 20. Why? Why would you? Oh, I guess that would break it. It's Python. Yeah, there we go. We've got temp. Sequencer's running. Stemma works. Okay, so I think gonna call that a fix. Uh, I'm not going to release this particular code because it's got temp sensors and displays and um, this is mostly for uh, the display so I will need to update this code. Um, maybe? Yeah. Thankfully, not a lot of people have the boards, so I can just go to each person, tell them they need to do this fix. Yeah, that's probably going to be easiest. And that way, everyone will be on the same code base. 
otherwise there's going to be people that haven't done the fix it's going to be on the old code and they're not going to get updated code if they haven't done the hardware fix so while that's a problem it's not a major problem and I would like to think everyone would voluntarily do the bodge fix uh, so their boards get more functionality I mean everything is everything right now is running like I wanted to design it to so everything's working how I wanted it to I got uh, stemma stemma QT working which means that the uh, the stemma QT breakout port now works automatically basically um, I got ITC working and this ITC display is now running on 12 and 13 that's how to fix the TR cowbell version 1.2 I2C bus design flaw now everything is working at least hardware wise how it should